Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming. So we had a presentation today from uh, Dylan on uh, using uh, GPUs and FPGAs in an as a service context for LHC. So uh, Dylan, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so you know, you uh, you gave the title already. So so that's um, and that's what I'd like to talk about today um, on behalf of the FastML team. Um, and just to sort of um, frame the problem or, or frame the, the reason that maybe we should be interested in this, I think it's sort of pretty well summarized in this plot. And this one is from CMS, but there's a, a fairly equivalent one from Atlas. It basically suggests that, you know, if we keep sort of doing what we've been doing for a while, uh, you know, our, our computing projections for CPU need are going to, to greatly outpace what we actually are able to obtain. Um, and this is, you know, only contributed to the fact, or only only contributed to by the fact that, uh, you know, interest in ML, interest in high latency algorithms is only increasing uh, more and more. And so the, you know, the, the need for computing solutions is only growing. Um, and what I'd like to basically suggest today is that coprocessors, and by that I mean GPUs or FPGAs in this context, although there are there are certainly others, offer uh, a very possible solution to, to some of these problems. Um, and what I'll point out is that um, the solutions are, are particularly useful when we're talking about uh, algorithms that run either at, at large batch size or at, at very large complexity. Um, so, you know, to sort of start things off, what's the simplest way you could think about um, implementing a coprocessor is, uh, is in a form called, uh, usually referred to as direct connect, um, where basically, you know, you as the, as the user are sitting on a CPU, uh, you're connected to a coprocessor through usually a, a PCI Express, and you basically have free reign to talk directly to and from that coprocessor with whatever inputs and outputs you need from, from the algorithm that you want to accelerate on the coprocessor. Um, and this is a nice, you know, way to, to prototype things it's useful in some contexts, but, but scaling this up can be very difficult. Um, you know, you can see what if I have multiple different hardware types that, that fit into this coprocessor. Now I as the CPU as the user have to know which type of, of hardware I'm dealing with. If I have different algorithms, sometimes it can be difficult to, to sort of uh, use these in a direct connect context. If I have a lot of CPUs, how do I manage, you know, do I need, I need a coprocessor attached to all of them, or I need to know whether I'm using a coprocessor or not. Um, so the, these things can get a little tricky, um, with the basic point being that the user doesn't necessarily want to know all the details of the coprocessor. Uh, if, if they're sort of a, a generic computing user, they, they really just want their algorithm to run. Um, and that's sort of where on-demand computing comes in. Um, you know, if I'm, I really just want my, my things to run and run quickly. So on-demand computing basically uh, sort of splits this up into a, a, uh, an extra part uh, from, from just the direct connect model. And it basically says, okay, now uh, we should think about this in terms of a client, which is the, you know, what the user basically is. Um, and this then can be either just a CPU or a, a cluster of CPUs. Um, and the client then talks directly to a server uh, and that server is a, is a CPU, and they basically send their request uh, and response for information uh, over the network. So this is not usually over PCI Express, although that's not necessarily uh, ruled out, but that's not usually the way this is designed. And then the server is basically the one that's direct connected through a PCI Express to the coprocessor like before. So the server has to understand, you know, whoever, when you, when you create the server, you need to understand how to talk to and from the coprocessor, but as the user, you really uh, can remain completely agnostic. And if the server wants to swap out the type of coprocessor or they want to change settings or they want to change the way that they communicate with the coprocessor, the, the client and the user don't actually have to see any of that and, and can remain completely agnostic. Um, and so you can see that this can actually scale really nicely. Um, and there's a lot of existing tools from industry, from cloud computing, um, that are are sort of going in this direction for these for these reasons exactly. Um, just to sort of 
give a, a little side by side of these two models. Um, so on the left is as a service, on the right is Direct Connect, and you can see this is for you know uh, a set of of users, a set of CPUs that are all trying to use a set of coprocessors. And so on the left you have as a service, with the pros here being that there's pretty simple support for mixed hardware. You know, in this in this little picture here, the the top coprocessors are using GPUs and the bottom ones are using FPGAs, and and that's just that's fine. There's nothing that, that sort of makes that difficult. You can see that this really does scale pretty well. Um, you know, you can scale up the number of clients, especially, and potentially not have to change the number of servers, the number of coprocessors. Um, you can get some nice throughput optimizations that we'll talk about later. Um, and the client side is also really simple. You know, it's just you're just sending uh, and receiving information over the network. Uh, on the other hand, Direct Connect uh, is is has some really simple connections here. You, you can see it. It's it's just you know a simple connection between the CPU and the coprocessor, um, and the network load is also not very very high because you're only ever sending inputs and outputs over the PCI Express. So there's there's certainly uh, um, there's certainly realms in which you would want to use either of these models. Um, but today I'll, I'll focus on it as a service. Um, now, in principle, as a service can be used for, for any algorithm. So I, I have this little schematic here uh, on the right with some, you know, set of algorithms that you're trying to run, you know, maybe in, a, in, a, in an event. So I have algorithm one, algorithm two, and I need both of those to, do, to get the output. So, you know, if in, a, in sort of the current processing without as a service, you know, maybe one thread runs algorithm one, run thread runs algorithm two, and then they both have generated the output that I want for that event, and I'm done. Obviously, this is a simplified model, but, but you get the picture. And then once that's done, I can run the next event. Um, once you once you start to use a GPU as a service or, or anything as a service, um, you can see that you know maybe algorithm two is really easily accelerated, um, and so the time it takes to run it on a GPU is really small. So in this model, then you know while the while the first thread maybe can run algorithm one. The second, you know, you don't actually need the second thread to run algorithm two, you just send it to the GPU and it runs really quickly. And then basically as soon as algorithm one is done, you can send it directly to the output and you can already begin processing the second event in the second thread. Um, and this is sort of an, the idea of, of why you can see that this using as a service can be, can be really beneficial to helping reduce latency um, and to, to, to speed things up. And you can also see that depending on how fast the GPU is at doing these, these, uh, this algorithm two in this case, you know, there's, there's all this extra, these extra slots in the GPU, this extra time that the GPU could use to, to help process even more events uh, than just these, these two that we're talking about here. So the GPU could, could be, in, in this case, serve multiple events or multiple machines all at once. Um, without ever actually having to, to slow down, without ever actually uh, reducing the, the speed. Um, and all that, this, uh, that the sort of client CPU in this case has to do to run this is to send the inputs to the server, and then the server has to output the, the or return the outputs. Um, and that's basically it. So obviously this picture here is for a GPU, but the, the server really just you know, it can be anything. It can be a GPU, an FPGA, as long as it's able to accept requests, uh, communicate with the coprocessor, and then return the answer. Um, and this sort of naturally flows into then the reason uh, that many industry tools focus on machine learning, um, which uh, sometimes is, is this MLAFAAS, so machine learning as a service. Um, the basic reason, I mean, there's, there's a few of them. The simple ones are that there's a small number of inputs for machine learning algorithms, especially compared to the relatively large number of operations and CPU compute time that, that may be taken, especially for really large uh, machine learning models, machine learning inference. You know, the CPU compute time could be huge, and so the speed up you could get by using a GPU to run this could be really, really uh, significant. And the other really nice thing about um, about these sort of as a service tools is that then the actual user doesn't actually need any knowledge of 
hardware language. So they don't need to ever write anything in HLS or RTL if it's an FPGA or in CUDA if it's a GPU. They just know that they send, they need to send, you know, the, the same inputs that they want for their inference to, to a, a specific IP address, basically. Um, and this then makes it really easy to integrate this in existing workflows that, that need to do inference. Um, CMS, which is, which is the experiment that I'm involved in, is, is, has, is exploring, exploring a lot of ML alternatives to, to traditional algorithms um, that, that are candidates, in, in my opinion, for, for machine learning as a service. And I'll talk about a few of them uh, later in the talk. One I'd like to focus on is Facile, which is, is a, an algorithm, is a, is a network for uh, HCAL local RICO. Um, but there's also alternatives that are being explored for particle flow, for MET, for clustering, for tagging, um, that, are, that are also um, really, really interesting in and of themselves. So uh, what is Facile? Facile is, is basically a, a network that's designed to perform the HCAL energy regression. So this is currently performed by an algorithm called MAHI, uh, which basically fits for the in-time pulse energy. So you see this little sort of schematic here on the top right with the different time slices. Uh, in 25 nanosecond intervals, and the different uh, energy deposits that come from the in-time pulses in those uh, in those bins, and then the outer time pulses that, that sort of leak into the other time slices. Um, and so the the algorithm here is, you know, maybe trying to to extract what the actual energy deposited from from the the TS4 pulses, but it has to extract that from the energy that also showed up from the TS3 pulse and the energy that leaked into the TS5, et cetera, pulse, uh, time slices. So, you know, that you can see why a, a fit is maybe the, the physics way you, you'd solve this problem, but in principle, you, you can also hopefully see why this is a really good candidate for an ML solution. So you can basically give it the same set of inputs as MAHI, the, the same set of, of energies per time slice as MAHI, but you don't have to ever worry about uh, you know, giving it corrections, encoding sort of um, physics calibrations into it because the model learns basically how to do this fit with the corrections and the calibrations sort of baked in already. Um, so it turns out that you can basically do this, this task with a, a very simple dense network that's quite small, so it's less than 2,000 parameters. Um, and with this, this dense network that we call Facile, you get uh, a pretty similar performance to MAHI. So if you look on the bottom plots here, you have the, the resolution on the left and the response on the right for MAHI and FASILE. MAHI is in green, FASILE is in orange. And you can see that, uh, you know, the resolution for FASILE is, is basically the same as MAHI at high energies, maybe a, a little bit better at low energies, uh, and, and you get a nice uh, close to unit response across most of the energy range for FASILE as well. So it, it, it performs pretty similarly. Um, and we're, we're working currently with the CMS HCAL uh, DPG to, to validate this network and to integrate it into the workflow so that we can actually use it in, in, in physics scenarios. Is there a question? Yeah, what do you mean by response? So sigma E over E, I think is pretty obvious. But I'm not sure what you mean by response on the right-hand plot. Uh, so response here is, is just the, the ratio of the the gen energy to the to the reconstructed energy. So these are rec hits here, reconstructed hits in the in the HCAL. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So you're basically saying the facile has the energy correction done much better than than Mahi. I'm saying that it's that it's yeah it's. it's in certain regions, it's better, and in certain regions, it's, it's comparable. And so there's, you know, the, there's, there's certainly no reason that, at least from these plots that you say, this is not a, a, a perfectly viable alternative. It looks like Mahi is, has better resolution at low energy, and the scale factor is always essentially correct instead of being off by 10% or 5% or more. I'm not sure I understood that. <clears throat> the green dots in the right-hand plot, 
the, the asymptotic value is not one and it should be, right? Yeah. So the, the, I should say the plot on the left is response corrected. So the, the correction for that non-unit response is, is already applied in the left when you look at the, wow. the resolution. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is this is facile, um, and and then I so, so now I'd like to talk about how you might, you know, how this might integrate into a an as a service workflow, um, and then I'll go through some some results for facile as well as other uh, benchmark models that we chose. So in in order to actually look at at, at running this as a service, we use. Uh, gRPC. Uh, so gRPC is a remote procedural call that was developed by Google, um, and it's what we use to actually communicate between the client, which I've drawn in, in green here, which uh, you know could be in the cloud, could be on the ground in a, in a compute cluster, whatever it is. Uh, it communicates via this, this protocol here to the server. It's, it's shown in, in orange here, uh, and then that server communicates is the one that's actually connected to the coprocessor over the PCI Express. So the coprocessor has to be designed to run the inference. Um, and this means different things if it's an FPGA or a GPU, obviously. Uh, the client itself is responsible for uh, multiple things. So it has to format the inputs in a, in a you know, way that the, that the server and the coprocessor find simple and to understand. Um, Ideally, it has to send a, a call, a gRPC call to the server. Ideally, that call should be asynchronous and non-blocking because this allows the client to then continue to do other things um, while it's waiting for the response from the server. Um, in, in CMSSW, we do this with a, um, with a module called the external work module, um, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, a bit later, uh, and then once it receives the response back from the server, it has to obviously in interpret that um, and, and reintegrate that, that response in, in a physics context for whatever the workflow is. Uh, the server is responsible for any sort of initialization that has to be done to run Facile on the coprocessor. It has to be able to receive the request from the client and you know, properly schedule it to be run on the coprocessor. It has to be able to actually communicate with the coprocessor, and it has to be able to get the, code, the output back from the, um, the coprocessor and then send those results to the client. Um, and then sort of uh, while all that's going on, it also is useful for, that, for the, the server to be able to monitor you know, the, the network conditions as well as the device utilization for, for purposes of, of diagnostic or uh, you know, optimization of, of exactly how to distribute the, the load of things. Um, I won't go too in depth about how exactly we set up the, the server code, um, just but I'll, I'll give a, just a few sort of comments about what it is in each in both the GPU and the FPGA case. So for the GPU, we use uh, the NVIDIA Triton Inference Server, which uh, is written to do exactly this: to do machine learning inference on GPUs, and then we have uh, customized Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes to, to spin up, you know, large numbers of, of servers and, and, these, uh, and these inference servers. For the FPGAs, the tools are slightly less mature, so we, were, we had to write our own FPGA gRPC inference server. So the, it uses the same um, sort of uh, message protocols, the message formats as the, the Triton inference server. Uh, but we had to write some of the back end ourselves. Um, but the, the nice thing here is that because we, we can make the, the two message formats the same, you can basically just change an IP address and you can run on an FPGA or a GPU and the client remains completely agnostic to this. Um, so, so that's a, a really nice sort of function of, of the fact that we wrote some of these ourselves and we're able to tweak them. Um, in terms of the client, uh, we use what's called Sonic, which stands for Services for Optimized Network Inference on Coprocessors, um, which was basically written uh, to be simple. <laughs> um, it's, 
it's available in CMSSW. Uh, and the, the main idea here is that uh, you don't need any knowledge, or the client doesn't need any knowledge of the coprocessor spec uh, when you use Sonic. So it's, it's integrated in CMSSW. There's, there's links here for, um, for anyone that's curious, uh, if you're curious about the core or the, the development branches here. Uh, and the NVIDIA Triton sort of external and client are also in CMSSW. So you can actually run sort of a, a fully realized um, GPU, I'll put GPU in quotes there, GPU based um, as a service setup in CMSSW. I put GPU in quotes there because if you don't have a GPU, um, there's actually a dockerized test setup. It, it will basically run the server as just a CPU, um, but it will look the same from the client perspective. Um, so this is a really cool thing that, that's already integrated in, in CMSSW. Um, and basically what this looks like for the user then is um, they basically just have to define uh, a producer that inherits from, from the Sonic producer and then is just responsible for, for saying, for listing what inputs it wants to send to the, um, to the server and what outputs it expects to receive back. Um, and that's basically it. Um, the, the only other thing is that the, the client then gives a particular server address that they include in the config. Um, and this then tells it which machine, you know, to, to send their, their requests to. Um, and this is part of the reason that, that you know, swapping between different uh, hardware specs is actually really, really simple um, because as long as the inputs and outputs that you're sending and receiving are the same, all you do is change an IP address in the, in the config and, and from the client perspective, nothing ever changes. And that I think is exactly how you, you want this sort of thing to, to function. Um, okay, so, so that's how we basically set this as a service um, work up. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to basically go through a few benchmark models that we've used to, to sort of test this um, and look at the performance uh, of this of as a service in in various contexts that I, I think are, are realistic for physics, uh, or at least useful for teaching us things um, for for our context. So the the first one, the first benchmark model is facile, which is the the algorithm that I already um, discussed. The second one is an algorithm called Deep Calo, which is uh, uh, an algorithm that's responsible for or does uh, eCal cluster energy regression. Uh, in Atlas. Uh, and then the, the final network that I'll talk about uh, is ResNet, which we've used for top quark image classification. So, so identification of jets that come from top quarks. Um, these algorithms are, are chosen specifically because they span sort of a range of different um, sizes and, and uh, performance and, and regimes. So facile is, as I already mentioned, a very small network, so it's less than 2,000 parameters. Um, and because it's so small, we we run it at uh, at large. We are we're able to run it at large batch. Um, so the, you know, the CMS HCAL has 16,000 channels, and so in principle, you could think about running this this facile network on each of those channels simultaneously for each event, and that would be running at batch 16,000. Deep Calo is a is a bit larger. So Deep Calo is around a million or so parameters, um, and so that's a you know a much larger network. Um, and because in principle you you would not need to run this anything close to sixteen thousand batch ten is is a much more reasonable uh, sort of target for the batch for Deep Calo. Uh, and then ResNet is is then also uh, about a few million parameters, uh, and this is. Uh, this then we run at, at batch 10 as well. Um, and so these are designed to sort of span a range of um, a range of sizes. Facile is also a fully connected network, whereas DeepCalo and ResNet uh, are are in large part convolutional uh, in their in their architecture. Um, if you look at then the these algorithms and how they perform, just the inference themselves on um, on GPUs and FPGAs, you can see then that we sort of get to span a range uh, of performances with respect to CPUs. So 
Uh, if you run Facile on a GPU or an FPGA, you can do this in, for a GPU, about two milliseconds. Uh, for an FPGA, you can do this in around 0.2 milliseconds, um, which corresponds to gains with respect to a CPU running Facile of about uh, eight for a GPU and about 80 for an FPGA. Quick question, when you make this comparison, are you comparing to running on a single CPU core? Yes. And what sort of a GPU are you talking about? I mean, are you, 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 are you, you it sounds like you're, you're, you're comparing apples with oranges here. So I'll get to uh, what type of GPUs we're using. Uh, these are, so this is just sort of a flash of some of the, um, the numbers here, but I'll go much more in depth in, in these things in later slides. Could I ask a quick question, um, Dylan? So when you do these yeah. comparisons, which I know you're going to elaborate on, but um, when you do the CPU versus, I assume when you're doing the GPU FPGA, it's, you know, on a Triton inference server. And th do you ship the data along or is the data pre-placed pre on the inference server so that like when you're doing the CPU, uh, is the CPU local or is it also on the in inference server? So, yeah, so I'll get to, I think okay. I'll get to some of this, but the, the basic answer is that the, the data is not pre-sent or anything like that. I mean, these, these are, I'll get to the exact workloads, but the data is, has to be shipped from anything that you want the server to know about has to be sent from the server or from the client to the server. Yeah, that, okay. Um, so That's what no I was sort hoping of, that the, sort of, the data you know, goes, you have to ship the data. <laughs> yeah, you have to ship the data to the inference server and you did that in these comparisons that includes the data. Right, you can, also be, you. You can obviously be selective about what you ship, which is an important part of this. Um, you know, you, you want to not ship anything you don't need, but, um, but yes, the, the data has to be shipped. Um, and then I'll get into exactly how, exactly where the clients and the servers are located in our test. So, um, but in, in, in all of them, the client and the server are separate machines. Um, the difference is only in, in sort of how, how long the network that connects them and, and how physically separate they are. Um, but they're all separate machines. Um, yeah, so for, for Deep Calo, the, the numbers are, you know, the, the numbers are totally different. It's a completely different size network, so you don't necessarily get the same uh, relationship or the same, you know, relative improvements when you look at GPU and FPGA. Um, so for a GPU, it, we'll get to the details of this number here, but uh, at sort of full, fully optimized, you can get to something like 0.1 milliseconds for the GPU, and this corresponds to basically an improvement over a CPU of about 750 times. Um, we, we are still working on the, the actual implementation of DeepCal on an FPGA, so we don't have exact numbers for the, the gain, but we expect it to be, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit worse than a, than a GPU, but, but not significantly. And then for ResNet, the numbers that you get for GPU and FPGA are, are fairly similar and correspond to basically something like a, a 500 times improvement uh, with respect to a CPU. Um, the, the basic idea and the reason that we've chosen these particular algorithms is, is that we think they sort of each sit in, a, in an interesting regime of where we might gain when, when actually accelerating things on coprocessors. So Facile, uh, as I mentioned, has this huge batch um, and so the, you, can, you can run it at, at really large batch size, but it's a very simple algorithm. Um, and so that's one region where we think that uh, the coprocessors have a, have a potential advantage over, uh, over just, just regular CPU inference. Um, and then the other regime in which we think coprocessors have, a, have an advantage is really significant algorithm complexity. So ResNet sits and at that other end where you're running it at low batch, but uh, but really high algorithm complexity. And then DeepCalo is sort of somewhere in the middle of these. It's, it's not quite as large as ResNet. Um, and in principle, you might think about running it with, uh, the, the network bandwidth is, is, is a little bit more than ResNet as well. So it, it sort of sits in this intermediate regime. And so that's why we've chosen these particular networks because we think um, they, they sort of span a, they sort of, they allow us to, to investigate this space and, and where things actually improve. Um, okay, so as promised, getting into some of the results a little more in depth. So um, starting with just a, a single GPU server. So this is a server that only has 
one physical GPU connected to it. Um, so this is done in Google Cloud. So the server is located in the cloud. Um, the clients are located um, <clears throat> on the Fermilab batch system. The, the inference then is we perform in, inside a, a standard CMS uh, job, a CMS workflow. Um, the actual sort of workflow that's run here is, is only the, this uh, particular, this, this client. So this is maybe the most pessimistic um, you, could, you could think of, right? So, so basically the, the, the client in this case is not able to, is not running anything else while it's waiting. So this is basically just a test of how you can, how, how many clients we can simultaneously run before the server gives out and saturates. Um, so the, the results for FastLile are on the left, for DeepCalo they're in the middle, and not for ResNet they're on the right. You can see that for FastLile, depending on, uh, and this gets to your point, uh, your question earlier of, of which types of GPUs we're running on, um, you know, the, a T4 saturates for FastLile around 400 uh, events per second, while a, a more powerful V100 saturates for uh, for with an added events per second of about 500. So you get a, uh, you know, a, a pretty non-negligible improvement when you, when you beef up the GPU. Um, the, the deep callow and the ResNet results are with a, a, a V100, and you can see the, the deep callow, we can get up to about six, maybe 650 events per second, and ResNet saturates around just a little less than 100. So the points here are that the, the larger models saturate with fewer clients as well. So you can see that for FastSile, it takes maybe about up to 50 or 100 clients to, to fully saturate the, the various GPUs, whereas for DeepCalo, the saturation happens somewhere between 20 and 50, and for ResNet, it happens somewhere between maybe 10 and 20. So, um, you know, the, the larger the model, the, the faster it saturates, and that's basically exactly what you'd expect. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we get this range of performance for the different GPUs. So this is just, this is maybe the, the simplest test you could think about running only about how, how you can saturate the, the, the GPU itself. Um, maybe a, an, an interesting test of, of sort of how network comes into play here. And this is um, definitely a, a relevant thing when you talk about it as a service, because obviously the client and the server are communicating over the network. Um, is, is a test that we did with a multi-GPU server. So here the server is still located in Google Cloud, but now we, we use a, a set of servers that, that have various numbers of GPUs attached to them. So we have uh, one GPU servers, we have four, we have eight, and we have 24 GPU servers. Um, the clients here in this test are located at MIT um, because we were able to control the network a little bit better there. Um, and they're, they're communicating between MIT and, and, and Google Cloud. And what you see then <clears throat> is that as we run uh, more and more simultaneous processes from MIT to try to really crank up exactly how many, uh, what the sort of maximal throughput is, you see that for the one GPU, as you, as you saw before, this saturates fairly quickly for, for fast dial around you know, 500 or so. Um, as you, if you add, GPUs, then you can sort of extend this saturation point and you can keep extending it until at some point you basically are capped by, by network concerns. So in this case, uh, you know, you get this linear, nice linear scaling with respect to the number of GPUs and the number of simultaneous processes until you hit about uh, 60 gigabits per second, which, uh, which is, is this, this number here, which is about 8,000 events per second uh, running. Um, and so this, you know, here we're talking about, um, I mean, the MIT NIC is, a, is 100 gigabits per second, um, but obviously that's, you know, not exactly the, the, the network bandwidth you'd get in, a, in an ideal world, but this is basically just a test of whether you can even come close to this with this sort of client server model. Um, and indeed, you can actually do very well. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the difference between the 160 is, certainly not all, not really attributable to the, to the as a service model and, and much more attributable to the, you know, realistic, uh, realistic uh, settings of a network. 
I've got a question again. Um, mm -hmm. So if I look at the um, the downward triangle for four GPUs, the throughput level in events per second is about 2,000. And when you move from uh, four GPUs to eight GPUs, the throughput roughly doubles to 4,000. But when you go from eight to 24 GPUs, uh, which is a factor of three, it now looks linear on this scale, but not if I account for the fact that you've actually increased the, the um, resource by a factor of three. It looks like you're only going up by another factor of, um, you know, less than two. Right. So this is the, this is the, um, the reason that the 24 point is saturated is actually has nothing to do with the GPUs, with the number of GPUs or the number of GPUs. It, it has to do with the network limits. So in our case, yeah, but, but in the real it, world, it, it, if you're paying for 24 GPUs instead of eight GPUs, you want to get, you, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. So I think that, I think interesting if, if you, in terms of what you would really want to use, it's not clear that you would want to go any more than eight. Well, so, so if you really, I mean, there's a couple things. I think if you really wanted to, to, to know this, to check how, whether the scaling continues, you would run this test fully locally. So you would you would have a machine in this case at MIT. You would connect it to, or you would have a machine fully local. You would connect it to 24 GPUs and you would run this test, um, and you would see whether or not you could get the the scaling to, to continue. Um, the other answer is that 24 GPUs is almost certainly uh, far far overkill for a for a particular server. Um, you know, buying, instead of having one HCPU server, it, you know, or instead of having one 24 GPU server, I would think that having three HCPU servers or having six to four GPU servers would be a much more logical way to construct sort of a, a, an at scale uh, system like this. This, this here was really just a way to, to saturate the, the network bandwidth without having the GPU bandwidth for the GPU limits come into play here. And, and that's, that was the point of, of this, this test that we ran. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's running with, with multiple GPUs. Now, um, one sort of really cool thing that you can do with, uh, with Triton Inference Server and with with uh, with this setup here, is you can do something called dynamic batching. So I mentioned earlier that the that the batch that we use for Deep Callow is uh, is ten because that's you know about the number of that's about the batch that you'd expect from you'd, you'd want to use from a, a physics perspective per event. But in principle, um, you can sort of see that there's there's no, the server has no concept of what an event is, right? It has a concept of the batch that it receives from a from a particular CPU, but because the the information from multiple CPUs can be are are being sent sometimes at the same time to the server, you know the server may receive multiple batches of ten for Deep Callow uh, in in very short succession. So in principle, what you can do is you can allow the server to wait for requests to build up, uh, and so then just sort of stack these on top of one another. Uh, and then run them at larger batch on the on the GPU itself. And then once they those those values or those batches that values those values return from the GPU, the server can then sort of reparse those into the the particular event by event batches that you want to return to the the individual CPUs. Um, so this is usually most beneficial for small batch algorithms that you can actually you know concatenate uh, lots of. Um, and you can see that this basically allows you to extend event by event processing or limits of event by event processing to multi event processing in a way that's completely transparent to the user. So, you know, something like CMSSW that really is written in a way that makes it very necessary to process things on an event by event basis uh, doesn't actually have to know about these, these limits. And, and you can actually do multi event processing sort of quote unquote inside 
the MSSW in this case. Um, Aren't you going to run into it's generic? Let me ask a question here. So from what I understand, with CMSSW, you really run into a thread limit of about eight concurrent events. You, you really can't get any better than that. A lot of it has to do with IO. Now, in order for this to work, you basically, since, since you, each of these you know, events has to wait until the, uh, the response from the GPU comes back, you're basically going to have to start scheduling more and more and more events concurrently in order for this to make any sense. Otherwise, you're going to have idle threads. Um, so how do you reconcile the, the, the two issues of, you know, you need to have many more concurrent events, but you can really only run eight events at once? Um, so I think the answer is that you can, you know, one server, one multiple clients can talk to one server is I, is I think the, the sort of simplest way that you set this up to, to optimize things, right? So that you, you wouldn't necessarily want to have one CPU trying to, to, completely saturate the GPU or completely fill this, this sort of dynamic batch itself, you have multiple CPUs that are all running that, that are attempting to saturate one server's batch. So that that server, you know, that those threads on those on the full range of, of clients that you have then <clears throat> are not are not waiting around as long as they would, or there's less than waiting around basically in that case. Right. I just, okay. maybe I can chime in uh, and the, just to make yeah. sure people understand what waiting really means. So, so here we're using an asynchronous call, which is enabled by the multi-threading in CMSSW. So while this call is happening, you know, other algorithms that run on the CPU are being processed. So the CPU is doing that work. It's not just sitting there. Um, further, even if, uh, it's waiting for the call to finish for one event, it can, you know, a, a thread that was, at first processing that event can actually do work for a different event. Um, so we can have tasks reassigned to different threads, which is not quite as efficient, but it's still more efficient than just waiting around doing nothing. Um, but the basic model here is that we offload enough stuff to the GPU to get a significant speed up, but there's still work being done on the CPU such that the GPU latency is not dominating um, the time to process the events. So overall, we expect very, li very little idleness. Have you actually tried this in real life or is this just in simulation? I mean, so we are running this on real CPUs. Um, now we have, we have to experiment with different amounts of offloading and different workflows and that's still to be done. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious as to see where the, the bottlenecks come in, you know, where the limitations are, how many events you can really handle at once um, uh, until you start running into the, the model. Right. But, but I think, I think Dylan's yeah, point so then comes back to how many events is that, you know, we, we have a, let's say we have a tier two with, you know, a thousand cores or something, right, that are all spread, spread on different nodes, then potentially we could have all of those pinging one server if that's the efficient mode of operation. And so then, you know, the amount of IO happening on one node for those events doesn't really affect the efficiency of using the GPU server, I, if that I, makes sense. Yeah. However, I think if you have a thousand CPUs pinging one GPU server, I think you're going to run into some network issues. <laughs> well, it depends on right. The, the, the network bandwidth could also become the bottleneck, um, which is one, something that I think Dylan already showed one results for that. Uh, so reducing bandwidth is one thing we're looking into. It's possible that we could add some sort of compression that would, you know, trade CPU for bandwidth in a way that would maximize our efficiency even further. Yeah, I mean, uh, all of these, I mean, I should say that these are, you know, the studies I'm, I'm presenting here are sort of the first, uh, you know, tests that we've done and experiments we've done to try to understand what some of the, the parameters of this space are. But a lot of this sort of as a service processing is is new, uh, especially to, to high energy physics, I think. So there's a lot of things that we have to sort of explore and a lot of those are, are very dependent, as you as you pointed out, on network sizes and bandwidth limitations, and and exactly mm -hmm. what the, the workflows that we're running are. So I, I will show a maybe a slightly more realistic workflow later on. Um, that maybe will give you a better idea of what this looks like in in you know not something not this sort of dummy workflow, but it it uh, it again will only accelerate one of the algorithms 
that's being run. So having having multiple ones of these is also something that needs to be explored. One last question about this kind of configuration. You would presumably have to devote one CPU to managing the service of the GPU. Is that correct? Yeah, so there's a, there's a right, the, the server is a is a CPU that it has to be allocated for that. So that would presumably be it's not just one CPU, but it's probably going to be one node on an HPC or something. Like that. It's not a single core. I'm just trying to think of this in a in a larger you know grid or HPC environment where you can't just ask for a single core on a node. You really have to request the whole node. Yes, yes, that's that's right. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's uh, there's certainly configurations you could probably think of where the the server is a the server and the client run on the same node that's the same actual machine that's not um, that's not explicitly forbidden in this sort of setup, but but obviously there are, are various complications that that would come from that if you tried to do this at scale. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, um, yeah, so that dynamic batching is, is really actually extremely simple to implement from a, um, from a configuration perspective. It's basically a one line change, um, that turns this on and off in the, in the inference server. So it's basically one that I've, I've shown here. Um, I've mentioned, I mean, the simplest way to set this up is to just give the server a, a preferred batch size that you'd like it to run on the GPU. But you can also specify, you can also do some, some more configuration like specifying a maximum wait time so that it doesn't take too long trying to wait for things to build up and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of how this actually improves performance, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's really impressive. So this is for Deep Calo here. Um, the, the, the triangles here are the, the points that that we showed earlier. So this is, you know, 650 is about the saturation point here at batch 10. <clears throat> and then if you turn on dynamic batching, you can see that one, it takes a lot more simultaneous processes to saturate this. Um, and it actually, it, it saturates at a, an event per second, it's almost 10,000 in this case, uh, which is about a 60 times gain. So this is a, a pretty huge improvement. Um, in, in terms of performance, and it basically comes for free. Um, there's there's almost I mean it, you know it's, it's a, a one line change here that's it's done this improvement. Um, so this is this is something that I, I think is is a really cool uh, cool thing that, that as a service computing opens up. Um, okay, so so the results that I've shown previously are for um, are for GPU servers. Um, as I mentioned, I, you know, we've also looked into FPGA servers. So the, the, the actual workflows that we've um, done for FPGAs are, uh, are similar. We tried to make them as similar as possible to GPUs. So we have the same gRPC sort of base so that you can use the same Triton calls that you use for a GPU to, to run on the, the FPGA. Um, and then in order to actually get uh, various different networks um, running, we, we use a, a set of different tools. So for smaller networks like Facile and Deep Calo, we use HLS for ML. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the work for Deep Calo is ongoing. For Facile, we've looked into running servers both on an Alveo U250, as well as in the cloud on AWS F1 instances. <clears throat> and then for ResNet, we've also looked at there's, there's sort of more commercial tools available because ResNet is a, is a much more um, sort of this, this conventional benchmark model that's used in industry all the time. I think it's uh, there's much more there's, there's more industry tools devoted to it. So we've used both Dynlinks ML Suite and run that on AWS F1s, and we've also used Microsoft Azure ML Studio and run that on the Azure Stack Edge, which is a, a dedicated uh, box that we installed, uh, a dedicated Azure device that we installed at at Fermilab um, that runs uh, uh, an Intel FPGA. Um, I won't get into sort of, to, I won't get into in depth about how we actually optimize some of the settings here, um, but because we do have control over a bit more in, I mean, because we, we design these servers ourselves, 
there's a lot more design settings to optimize. So, you know, there's all sorts of, of parameter scans and all sorts of setting scans that we that we did to try to make sure that we were getting the the optimal performance out of out of all of these. Um, and, but uh, but again, I, I won't go in too in depth into them. But there's there a lot of work went into this. Um, so the then to sort of mimic the results that I showed for the GPUs, looking at uh, at a single FPGA or at, a, at our FPGA servers here. Again, the, the clients for here are located uh, at, in the Fermilab batch system, and then the FPGA server is located either uh, on another machine at Fermilab, in the case of the Azure Stack Edge, or located in the cloud, uh, in the case of uh, ResNet in Xilinx ML Suite. So um, for Facile on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, this is uh, a single FPGA, this is the Alveo U250 at Fermilab. Um, and you can see that uh, running FASA, we can saturate at, at a larger number of clients than we did for the GPUs at around 200 simultaneous processes. And we saturate uh, at about 10x of what the, the GPU saturates at, which is about 5,000 events per second or maybe a little bit more. Um, and the limitation here is actually not from the FPGA, we believe, but from the CPU itself. Um, so the FPGA here, uh, we our tests have suggested the FPGA would be capable of something closer to 10,000 events per second uh, for FASA. Um, for so this is a I mean, this is a huge improvement with respect to both CPU and GPU for FASA. For ResNet, um, the the performance results we get are basically comparable to or slightly better um, throughput with respect to the the GPU. So for um, for ResNet here in the middle run uh, on AWS with eight FPGAs, we, we saturate at about 140 events per second. I think the GPU, eight GPU model saturates at about 500, or sorry, 150 events per second. So there's, you know, the, the numbers here are, are, are pretty close. Um, whereas the, the Azure Stack Edge, which has, has really been targeted and optimized for ResNet, um, saturates at, at a bit higher. Uh, on one FPGA than, uh, than the one GPU reference. So it saturates at about 40 or 40 plus events per second, uh, and the, the one GPU saturates at about um, 25 or so. So, you know, for, for the FPGA servers, then we find that they're comparable to or slightly better. Um, so all these tests that I've shown up until now have been this sort of dummy workflow uh, where the only job being run in the in the CMS job is the the accelerated client. So the client sends the request and then it basically has to sit there and wait because there's nothing else to schedule. Um, and this is useful for, for saturated bandwidth and, and saturating the, the the accelerators, but it's obviously not a very realistic workflow that you'd actually run. Um, so what we did to try to test this was to use Facile in the CMS HLT workflow to actually test as a service in a realistic computing environment. So what we did is to replace the, the current non-ML MAHI algorithm that runs in the HLT with a, uh, with a facile-based uh, HCAL reconstruction uh, done as a service. So we did this in, uh, in Hep Cloud, um, where we basically spin up a, a large amount of clients in, in the cloud, and we spin up a server node in the cloud as well uh, that runs Facile. And then we use that to, to basically try to test this uh, and, and saturate the, the server. So for the GPUs, we used Google Cloud. For the FPGAs, we used AWS. Um, and what we find is that, um, so the, the HCAL processing in the HLT takes around 10% of the computing time when you when you look at the, the total HLT time. And what we find is that by accelerating or by, by offloading this, this work as a service, we can basically get that 10% uh, compute time back. Um, so at the left is the GPU, specifically a V100 GPU. Um, and you can see in dash, uh, both for the left and the right, the dash is sort of just the nominal HLT with Mahi, so, so no as a service, uh, no ML, nothing like that. And then you can see that uh, when we accelerate on either one or four GPUs, you can basically see this nice 
uh, reduction of about 10% in the, in the total time spent. Um, at some point, the, the GPU saturates, um, and for the, uh, for, for the B100, this happens around uh, 300 simultaneous processes pinging one specific server. And so after this, you see that this one GPU model here, uh, instead of just uh, staying stable at a reduced processing time, starts to, to increase roughly linearly because the, um, because the GPU is now occupied and it's, it's just sitting around, I mean, the jobs are sitting around waiting for the GPU to be available. Um, for the FPGA on the right, uh, you see something pretty similar, except the, the main difference here is that the, the latency increase and the saturation point here happens uh, because of the, the improved performance of the FPGA happens at a much larger number of simultaneous processes. So instead of happening around 300 for the GPU, it happens around 1500 for the FPGA here before you, you see this increase. Um, but this means that, you know, in these cases, in this configuration, um, you would need, you'd only need one, one GPU to serve 300 clients and you'd only need one FPGA to serve 1,500 clients. So, you, I mean, you, you can see that this, this there, there, you can serve a large number of clients successfully with, um, with, a, with a small number of servers in, in these cases. Um, one comment I'd like to make about the FPGA is that um, you might notice here that the factor of five improvement or so between the FPGA over the GPU doesn't seem to be realized, or it, isn't, it seems to be less than the, you know, 10x that I showed earlier um, in, in some of those results. <clears throat> and the difference here is that um, the results I showed earlier were for the Albio, which was, um, which was connected uh, at Fermilab with a 100 gigabit NIC. In, in these tests, because we run them on AWS, the network bandwidth is limited to 25 gigabits per second to the AWS F1. And that means that it's 25 gigabits per second if you sort of compute out how how large our batches are and how many inputs we use corresponds to basically a maximal throughput of uh, 2,500 events per second. Um, and then if you, so you can sort of, sort of see that's half of what the 5,000 events per second we saw with the Alveo was. And so instead of getting a 10X improvement, you get about a 5X improvement. Um, and so this is fully consistent with the saturation we see here. Um, but in principle, we would expect that if we were to be able to, to use the Alveo or an Albio with a 100 gigabit NIC in this um, in this test here, that we would be able to, to increase that saturation point out to around 3,000 simultaneous processes. Um, okay, so um, a couple comments that I'd like to make before we close is, is about configuration. So, um, you know, as a, as a service is, it's, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of a very open-ended paradigm. It's, you know, there's, it's quite new, and it, I think it opens up a lot of design options that certainly have not been fully explored. <laughs> um, but you can sort of start to think about how you might actually implement this, um, and there's certainly various different uh, ways you could think about trying to set this up. Um, these are for, in the context of, of HLT, but, I mean, in principle, the, the um, the configuration is not, and there's nothing HLT specific necessarily about what I've dropped on here. Um, so you could think about having servers for each algorithm. So in the, in the top right here, this is sort of what I was mentioning earlier, that in principle you could have the servers and the clients run on the same nodes and have basically, you know, particular threads on each node, maybe managing the, the requests and the, the receiving of them. So in this case, you know, the, the left node here, is a facile is connected to a facile GPU or GPU that runs it's, it's set up to run facile. The middle node is set up to run you know PF in a in a machine learning format, and the right one maybe is set up to run tracking. Doesn't have to be machine learning um, on a GPU, and they basically pass the the inputs that they need between each other. You could also split off the sort of server from the client, and that's the the sort of diagram that I've shown on the bottom left here, where now you have a dedicated server CPU that is responsible for facile. So all the HLT nodes here send their facile inputs to that server. And then that server could be set up to do to be using FPGAs or it could be set up to be using GPUs. But in principle the the, the nodes here would 
would be completely agnostic to it. And in principle, you could have some fast file servers that use GPUs and some that use FPGAs. Um, and then the same thing is true for the inputs for MLPF. Um, the HOP nodes send that to, to this server and they send their tracking inputs to the tracking server. Um, you could also think about having a server that, that is connected to multiple coprocessors. And that's the, the diagram that I have on the bottom right here. So, you know, maybe some set of nodes pass all their inputs for multiple algorithms to a server, uh, to a particular server, because maybe there's some overlap here in the inputs that you want for tracking and for MLPF or something like that. And so you can sort of make use of the redundancy there to, to reduce the total network bandwidth. Uh, and then the server runs all of these, uh, these, uh, these algorithms simultaneously or, or whenever it can, and then it returns the results back to, to the nodes once it's, it's finished. Um, and exactly how you have to, to split up the, you know, exactly how to, how to do this design, how to configure these things is something that I think depends very strongly on the, um, the types of algorithms you're running, the number of algorithms you're running, how optimized they are, or how, how well they perform on the various coprocessors themselves, um, exactly how much data you're transferring. Um, all of these things play into what the sort of optimal configuration should be. Um, and that's part of the reason that it's, it's so useful for, for us to do these tests to try to understand which, which ones of these are, are most useful for our purposes. Um, so to sort of summarize what I've, what I've tried to, to show you in this talk, and I think that as a service computing has a ton of tools that, that we can leverage uh, in TEP to address some of our computing challenges. And I think these tools are very cohesive and, and designed to be used very easily with ML, although that's not, uh, that's not a requirement for their usage in a lot of cases. Um, and I think the really nice thing about as a service is that it's designed to be simple for the, for the user. Um, we've, uh, we've recently um, written papers detailing using GPUs as a service, which I link here, um, and FPGAs as a service, which we've submitted to uh, H2RC20. We, we also recently received a, an award from the Internet2 Foundation um, for, for cloud credits to, to continue some of this work uh, at, at much larger scale than we've been able to do so far. Um, and so I think there's a lot of possibilities for, for improving uh, the work that we've done and, and expanding it. Um, and so I'd like to close with just some comments on this. Um, and I sort of think that the, that the next steps basically have two separate lines of development. Um, so on one hand, I think the, the tests that we've done so far are, uh, are really critical, but the, they're, they're somewhat uh, limited in their scope. And so what I think we'd like to do uh, moving forward is to basically expand the scale of our testing. So we've tested this, this one HLT setup that I, that I gave you uh, four, but again, that's only one single algorithm that's been accelerated. So um, what we'd like to do is to test more accelerated algorithms and to test more of them simultaneously and to test various, some of these configurations that I, that I showed you earlier to try to understand how you might actually design this configuration to, to, to set things up properly for the HLT in this case. Um, and this was possible, this, this I think we, we can make possible with some of this, with this award we've received and, and the, the large amount of cloud credits we, we are able to, um, to now make use of, hopefully. Um, the other thing that, that I think would be really interesting to look into is, is some offline production workflows, uh, obviously at a scale. Um, you know, the HLT is, is a nice uh, use case for us and was, was a really interesting starting point, but obviously that's only you know, one part of, of the possible workflows you might think could make use of as a service computing. Um, and then also sort of somewhat related, we'd also, we're also looking into to testing with some DOE uh, HPCs. Um, you know, these are maybe more realistic for, for HEP usage in the long term uh, than, than, you know, buying cloud credits, but, um, but they have their own, you know, sort of um, subtleties that make them slightly different to use. So, um, you know, we think that, that working on, on both the cloud and the HPC tracks simultaneously is, is really the best avenue. Um, and so that's sort of one, uh, one sort of line of, of development. The other is, is on the algorithm side. So um, 
you know, the, the, the algorithm that I showed FastIO is actually a, a relatively simple algorithm, but there's all sorts of, I mentioned that there's all sorts of the um, sort of nominal CMS workflows are, are being investigated with, with ML counterparts um, or ML alternatives. So I think the, you know, the, the interesting thing would be to start looking at even more of them. So one, one sort of relatively open uh, task currently is, is doing some sort of local clustering uh, with machine learning. So the, the plot I show here is the, is the HCAL with the colors representing different HCAL clusters. Um, and this is work that, we're, that we've started to try to train an algorithm to go from uh, RecIFs to, to PF clusters, um, which is one of the, the main sort of missing components of, um, of, of a full ML chain starting from sort of detector level information to, to physics objects. But there's all sorts of other um, places that, that we think that, that ML might be useful in terms of improving performance um, and sort of allowing us to, to really accelerate more and more of our, of our algorithms. Thanks. Cool, thanks Dylan. Um, we had plenty of questions during the meet, uh, talk. Are there more questions? I have a question. Um, thanks again for a, a very interesting talk. What I'm wondering is, are there any, you know, authentication issues or things like that if you're working in a grid or, or a, an HPC environment? Do all of the, re, the requests to the server have to be from the same user ID or the same job, or can one server be sh shared among multiple different people? So that's a good question. So, I mean, in the current setups we have, there is no authentication really um, because we have control over these things as long as the you know as long as the request is able to be received by the by the server node it, it's it's processed um, as long as it can be processed um, I, I think certainly there there are ways to to integrate some sort of authentication in the in the server code um, but that's not something we've currently done but it, but it is certainly something that you might be interested in in doing uh, with some of these sort of larger slightly more open, um, you know, grid applications, HPC applications. Hi, anybody else? Well, we, I think we went on long enough already anyway, so. Um, Right, thanks again, Dylan. Uh, please follow up with Dylan offline if you have uh, other questions that you think of later. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks very much, Dylan. Very good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.